Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Ikim Inspirasi Inforia Islami. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. You're with me Mazina Ismail once again every Saturday at 6pm. We are back to bring to you this program, Great Works of the Muslim World, Nizam Al-Muqsiya Satnameh, the Book of Government is our topic this week. And we have once again our guest to speak about our topic. Uh, Mr. Muhammad Usni Muhammad Amin, Senior Research Officer at IKIM Center for Science and Environment Studies, or short as KIAS. Assalamualaikum, Usni. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, Mas. Uh, yes, how are you? Yes, uh, I'm good, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. So as I said, I have already mentioned the topic for this week. Our next uh, figure yeah. or our next work to be discussed is Nizam al Muqsiyasat Name, the Book of Government. So uh, perhaps before we find out or we learn about the Siasat Naimeh or Book of Government in English, uh, which you said was written in the middle of the 11th century by Abu Ali Hassan Ibn Ali Tusi, a wise scholar and competent vizier of the Seljuk Empire, or better known by his honorific title Nizal al muk Order of the Riyam. So uh, how about we find out about his background before we go uh, to his work, Husni? Yeah, uh, thank you, Mas. Bilaan Shaitan Rajim, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alamin, Wassalatu Salamu Ala Ashrafil Ambiya Umur Salin, Wa Ala Wassabi Ajma'in. So uh, Abu Ali Hassan bin Ali Tusi, uh, who was better known by his honorific uh, title Nizam Al Mulk, as, as you said, it is uh, it means the order of the Riyam, of order of dominion, Nizam meaning. Uh, or uh, intizam meaning orderliness. So nizam means the order. Uh, I mean, when, when we talk about uh, government of governance or administration of an empire, so uh, he started from the bottom, and then he became a great leader for the empire. For w- why we particularly zoom into this uh, figure because he's such a great leader for an empire and for a long time uh, spanning over 20 years and uh, this is especially so after the assassination of uh, the sultan of the Saudi empire uh, al-parslan in 1072 so uh, nizam al-mulk he was born uh, on 10th april uh, in, in somewhere in 1056 uh, in a village called Radakan near Tus in what we know today as Iran and uh, his father Ali Ibn Ishaq uh, he served as the financial officer to the Persian Ghaznawi uh, government so during that time you have the uh, Abbasid Caliphate which is uh, the t- titular leadership of all Muslim world centered in Baghdad. And then you have so many uh, you know, autonomous sultanates and the, the more prominent ones were the Saljuk uh, Sultanate the, uh, of Rum in, in Anatolia. And then to the east side, you have the great uh, Saljuk Empire. This is uh, ruled by... This is how... To understand the situation, we have to look at how the both sultanates had been established. Uh, you see, in the in the early of uh, the early of uh, 10th, 11th century, Tughril Beg uh, led this nomadic uh, Turk Turkmen uh, in Turks uh, called the Saljuks. They are of, of shoot of the Huzia. Uh, Turks, which Ibn Fadlan met in 915. So they had been conquering the eastern part of the Anatolia. They were roaming there. And then uh, this is to the eastern part of Byzantium, of Byzantine Empire. And then they installed uh, Tughril Beg as their first uh, sultan. But when uh, near 1043, uh, when uh, Tughril Beg, uh, he died, his empire was split in half. One was uh, given to his uh, the son and then uh, the other part was uh, inherited by his nephew Al-Parslan. 
and then Al Parsalan ruled together the the Great Seljuk Empire with his son uh, Sultan Malik Shah. So when Al Parsalan died, the the task of administrating the empire uh, fell to his son uh, Malik Shah the first. And he recruited. I mean, uh, there were many wars. Uh, there was in Iran the Ghaznavid Empire, and uh, which was uh, created when uh, Sultan Mahmud of Ghazna uh, became the first Sultan. He, in fact, he was the one who first time in Muslim history had won the title of Sultan, meaning uh, he who had been given Sultah. Uh, as the receptacle of power. So, Nizam al-Mulk, uh, he first, uh, his father, uh, he served as financial officer to this Ghaznavi uh, government. And then when the Saljuk, they d- defeated in battle, the Ghaznavids, in the battle of Danda Naran in 1043. And they... Uh, they occupied uh, uh, Khorasan. They uh, conquered many parts of uh, Khorasan. Uh, this officer, Ali, he fled to Ghazni and uh, Abu Ali Hassan, which uh, later would become known as Nizam al-Mulk, he followed his father to Ghazni and there he joined, uh, he held his first uh, position in uh, government and he remained there for say three or four years and then he left uh, Ghaznavi, the Ghaznavi palace and began to serve the Saljuk, the Turks. So, uh, and then we know uh, how uh, it turned out uh, in 1085 or so. Uh, that was the peak of the Saljuk uh, Empire. They began to encroach into uh, the Byzantine lands, the Byzantine uh, territories. Uh, during this time, uh, Aparsalan and uh, uh, Aparsalan, uh, no, uh, Malik Shah, uh, but before that, even uh, they had managed to conquer large tracts of Byzantine lands. So, uh, with Nizam al-Mulk uh, as the head of the administration. He uh, dealt, he dealt with domestic affairs that left Apasalan before he was assassinated and his son Malik Shah free to engage their military element, uh, the thing that uh, which until to the point where uh, they managed to uh, defeat uh, the Roman Byzantines at the Battle of uh, Manzikert, where they defeated the Byzantine army and also captured its emperor for the first time in history that the Muslims were uh, able to defeat and capture a Byzantine emperor by the name of uh, Romanos IV. So, uh, and because of that, uh, Nizam al muk he he gained uh, prestige. Uh, he was given the trust to manage the Great Saljuk Empire, and he was entrusted to quell many uh, rebellions uh, during his time uh, and uh, during that time when Malik Shah uh, commissioned the authorship the writing of several books on governance on on administration and from all from this many a few a few books uh, nizam al muks was the one that uh, sultan malik shah personally picked to be the best uh, book um, uh, written and he made this book as the standard or the standard manual or doctrine to be incorporated in in government in the government in his uh, government and later on uh, in 1092 Nizam al-Mulk was suddenly uh, assassinated 
I was uh, highly suspected to be uh, one of the members of the Assassin, uh, the the assassins under Hassan Sabah. Uh, they were the Nizari uh, Batiniyah uh, group led by Hassan uh, Sabah. So he died uh, 14 October 1092. So that's a little bit of uh, his background. Thank you so much, uh, Husni, yeah. for the interesting yes. historical side and this background. So now, uh, going back yeah. to his work, yeah, Siasat Nameh or the book of government. Uh, besides that book, what were his other accomplishments? Is there any? So, other? yeah, of course. Uh, so after, like I said, uh, his, uh, he particularly shines, you know, after uh, Al Parsalan was. Uh, assassinated in 1072 mm -hmm. and uh, uh, when Malik Shah uh, as succeeded his father uh, he immediately set uh, Nizam al -Mulk. he retained Nizam al as his wazir, his vizier or today we shall know as uh, prime minister so uh, Nizam al uh, immediately uh, he was actively building a network of schools or, or colleges known as Madrasah uh, Nizami yeah? and he invited you know top scholars to become uh, head of to head the uh, Nizami yeah? Madrasa. and one of these was uh, the venerable Imam al Haramain al Juwaini who had previously been persecuted by Tughril Beg because Tughril Beg was a Muqtazilite and he doesn't like Al Juwaini, who was an Ash'arid, to be teaching uh, the tenets of Ash'arah, and uh, but uh, under Malik Shah, he invited uh, uh, Imam Al Juwaini uh, to teach there and to become the head of this Madrasah Nizamiyah, where Imam Juwaini taught for twenty six years, and it was during the time under uh, the administration of Nizam Al Mulk that the Madrasah had bloomed and continued to grow uh, so much so that later in uh, we can see that after 100 years uh, we can see that a traveler by the name of Sheikh Ali ibn Abu Bakar al-Harawi uh, he mentioned he mentions in his uh, travel log called Kitab al-Shirat fi ma'rifat al-ziyarat a book of directions or book of guide or guidebook uh, uh, to the knowledge of places that, that are worth visiting uh, that in Khorasan, in the whole of Khorasan there were three uh, places, three cities best known for uh, as, as learning centres for studying hadith and religious uh, sciences and the, these were in Herat in today's Afghanistan in Balkh and Sijistan. So we can see how the Madrasah Nizamiyah's network had branched out. So it's, it's really influential. It was uh, very uh, prestigious in whole of Khorasan as well as the great uh, Saljuk Empire. So in the year 1091, uh, this is after some time, after, six years after Al Juwaini uh, died, uh, Nizam al uh, he encountered the great uh, Imam Abu Hamid, Muhammad, Muhammad al Ghazali, who previously was one of the students of Imam Juwaini. Uh, he met him at one of his Mu'askar or military encampment. So, Imam Ghazali was uh, a rising star in uh, Sha'ari uh, Sunni scholarly circles. And he was traveling uh, from places to places. And one of the places that he en ended up was the Amu'askar of Nizam al-Mulk. And there, he was so impressed with uh, Al-Ghazali. And he invited him to now head uh, the Madrasah uh, Nizamiyah to become a teacher and also a professor uh, there. So, um, and, and throughout... His career, Nizam al uh, he succeeded in achieving several uh, objectives. He created uh, employment opportunities for Turkmen 
who had migrated to Iran during uh, particularly uh, heavy snowfall season in Persia because the Turkmen, uh, they were nomadic people at that time. Their way of life uh, had threatened the country's uh, economic and political uh, stability. So he invited them, he created uh, within this great Saljuk Empire you know, opportunities for them. And also uh, he successfully exhibited uh, this, the power of uh, Sultan uh, Malik Shah in terms of organizing uh, the strength and mobility of the army. And also uh, he's shown compassion for the Sultan's uh, opponents that earned him some name there. And uh, he was also responsible for maintaining uh, Sunni and Shia, uh, I mean, uh, relations, relations to the Sultan. And he, uh, well, to, I mean, to increase the use of uh, the Sultan's own relatives as governors of provinces. So, so this made him very uh, valuable to the Sultan. Remember that uh, Malik Shah, he was Saljuk Turk, and Nizam Malmuk was of uh, Persian. So he, here we can see that uh, not only the Muslim empires, they are multicultural, uh, but also that they can accept somebody even from a rival uh, empire, from the Ghaznavids, uh, to come and serve a particularly important uh, position in uh, the government. Uh, they do not, uh, this is somewhat, uh, uh, sometime, uh, some, somewhat very advanced. Uh, political uh, thoughts. So normally, you don't invite somebody from a rival group and become uh, your administrators for fear that he might sabotage your government and administration. But here, because Al Parsalan and uh, Malik Shah, they were really uh, good judge of character. They can see somebody's uh, worth in administration, the skills that. Uh, Nizam Malmulk uh, had. So that's why they re retained him. And they were right to do so because when we see in the history that another accomplishment of Nizam Malmulk was he prevented disputes over the inheritance of Malik Shah. Remember that Malik Shah was Tughril's back uh, nephew, not his direct uh, descendant. So this is particularly important because after Aparslan had died, naturally, you know, rulership would revert back to the descendant of the original uh, sultan. But this did not happen. I mean, uh, Nizam Malmuk had managed to uh, cool off the uh, the tension between the rival uh, ruling families, and at the same time. He managed to maintain, you know, create a good uh, relationship between the great Saljuk Empire and the Abbasid uh, Caliphate, where the Caliph of all the Muslims uh, resided. So, so because the Caliph is uh, not only just a political ruler, but he's also the religious and spiritual uh, leader of uh, the Muslims. So, apart from Although we, here we can see that although Nizam al -Mulk did not write many books, he himself was a Shafi, accomplished Shafi'i scholar, but uh, we can see his great works, you know, other than a written book, he had many uh, accomplishments with regards to uh, politics of his time. Uh, must. Right, interesting. Yeah. Now, um, as you have done, you know, in our previous episodes, uh, would yeah. you give us also this time a brief rundown of the book of government? Yeah. So uh, this book uh, is very interesting because it was written, uh, as I said, it was written at the request of Malik Shah. Mm -hmm. And Nizam al Muk had written this work, had prepared this work as uh, a manual for administration and management of the country. Because... Uh, 
and in the particular chapter it also addressed the issue uh, of uh, how we may look as his rationale behind writing this book because uh, you know with the business with any business of governing or administering a large empire you have uh, have enemies outside and inside the, the countries and that was during the time also when the Nizari uh, Batania they were causing uh, insurrection they were inciting uh, you know people to uh, to rebel and uh, and so Malik Shah had requested people to produce books on government administration and and troubles facing the nation he commissioned also Nizam al to investigate why were there many uh, troubles and man, where, why were people uh, rising up so uh, but and and this book it consists of 50 uh, chapters it concern uh, politics uh, religion and various other issues and also uh, it is also concerned with guiding the ruler with regard to realities of government and how the government should be run and uh, it talks about also the proper role of soldiers uh, police uh, during that time they were called uh, shurtah because they they make sure that the populations adhere to the shurut to the laws and regulations of spies uh, and here he mentions how you know uh, spies should be used to uh, not to harm the population or not to uh, i mean eavesdrop but to find out what were actually the problems faced by the subjects of the empire uh, of the people they, they, in their in their daily lives and also uh, talking about uh, finance uh, officials because they were the ones who managed the Iqta'at or the uh, assigned lands to the lords and the many you know uh, military commanders in the region in the empire and also this book provides ethical advice emphasizing the need for justice and rel religious piety in the ruler because uh, we can see in many you know even uh, Imam Ghazali's book on uh, on council for kings, you can see that there is a recurring theme. Even uh, they take from ancient uh, empires and these sort of uh, anecdotes that emphasize on justice, you know, gain currency with people like Nizam al Muk and Ghazali because they knew that only with justice that can an empire uh, endure and with oppression uh, an empire is only uh, you know uh, counting days to its destruction and uh, with regards to religious piety they know that only ruler ruler who a ruler who follows religious laws and maintains uh, a moral uh, character they will not transgress their boundaries. They will not commit uh, oppression uh, willfully. And they will take care of their subjects and people and protect them. And uh, he sees, uh, with regards to justice, Nizam al Mulk you know, defines in detail what he views as uh, justice uh, and that uh, people will be given their due. I mean, this is uh, almost a universal conception of justice, putting things at the proper place you know, and giving uh, rights to, uh, to their owners. And uh, this is the, also the theme of the Quran when God says that uh, uh, to render uh, trust to their holders and not to uh, take, uh, you know, to give them to people who are ignorant and that uh, the weak uh, should be protected and uh, and where possible 
uh, justice is defined by both the custom and Muslim law, the Sharia, and the ruler is especially held accountable and responsible uh, to God. And with regards to the materials compiled in this book, we can see that it is classified to, uh, say, uh, six categories, uh, you know, uh, advice. Uh, we can see that uh, chapter one and two deal with the theory and theology of kingship. And every chapter opens up with a passage offering practical instruction on some aspects and functions and duties of uh, the monarch, the ruler. And uh, secondly, uh, quotations, traditions and saying here, we can see how it is also similar to what uh, other great scholars such as Imam Ghazali, how they write uh, their books. They will always you know, start off with the verse of the Quran, you know, uh, before making their point and then supporting it with the relevant uh, hadith. And then they will also look into the athar or the sayings of uh, famous wise men. And uh, thirdly, uh, they also include, I mean, uh, Nizam al-Mul also included in the book uh, anecdotes, uh, anecdotes to prove his points. Uh, here we can... There are two stories uh, that I can uh, touch on. One is the story of the ancient Persian king, uh, Baharam Jur, and the story with him and his prime minister or wazir uh, Ras Ravishin. And then this story talks about how the king was unaware of the injustices of his uh, wazir Ras Ravishin and because he was ignorant of the latter's conduct, uh, you know, uh, it was revealed that his country was getting uh, weaker and then there were many uh, uh, insurrection and rebellion. People were, were angry at the king and then he set out to find out the root of this problem and then he discovered how his prime minister, Ras Ravishin, were, was doing oppression and then taking you know properties uh, from the poor people and uh, in, and then uh, and then uh, torturing uh, people, sending people to jail for uh, uh, unjustly, and then uh, we can we cannot help but notice also the that Nizam al Malmut was bringing also some of the anecdotes he learned while serving. In the Ghaznavid Empire, there were stories about uh, Sultan Mahmud uh, Ghazna in the book. And uh, he also included uh, long stories. I mean, there's a particular chapter when he dealt, he was dealing with the, the current uh, political situation of the Great Saljuk Empire, which, where I said that they were facing uh, rebellions and insurrections incited by the Batinis. And to prove his point that the Batinis uh, had a heretical uh, origin uh, going back as far as the ancient uh, Mazdakism, I mean, the false religion that was known to have emerged during the time of the Persian Empire, during the reign of King uh, Kobat and his son, Prince Anushirvan, uh, the story about how this uh, proto-socialist uh, ideology took root when King Kavad uh, began to adopt it as an official uh, religion, not knowing that Mazdaq was a false uh, prophet. And in this false uh, religion, uh, it, it shows that... Uh, why we call it, uh, why the translator Hubert Dake called it as a proto-socialist proto uh, religion because it had these elements of uh, equality, e egalitarianism. I mean, everything, uh, everyone is an equal, all the social hierarchies uh, removed, uh, no classes uh, in the society, 
so everybody shares it got to the point where it is destroying the nation's wealth and it got to the point where it is also destroying the morality of the people they were sharing so much wealth uh, uh, between the rich and the poor it got so egalitarian and it got so equal to the point where even wives uh, of people uh, are being shared so it led to the destruction of the social uh, fabric and the story goes how you know he went to tell about how the clever the intelligent uh, prince anushirvan who later became the emperor and succeeded his father how he contrived this strategy to uh, uncover the falsehood of this uh, false prophet uh, mazdak and defeat him and there were also in this book uh, stories of contemporary uh, events because remember this book was written in order to uh, investigate and also provide solution to the troubles that uh, to the, uh, that was that were brewing in the empire and also it's got a historical uh, narrative uh, to it so that's basically what i can give uh, on the brief rundown of the book mas very good mashallah but i would like to ask you husni i mean you have read the book yeah. at least a brief yes. do you find you know the book relevant to this day in terms of uh, government administration yeah because uh, this book like i said it was written particularly during a trying time and it was written mm. by a prime minister of the empire uh, because uh, we, we here we can say that the proper position of the prime minister of the wazir in the great saljuk empire because like i said he was the wazir for 20 years and mm-hmm. he knew uh, based on his long experience serving in the ghaznavid uh, government and later on he brought that experience along with him and used that rich experience his experience dealing with people dealing with government officials in, dealing with the iqta uh, system the way that they divided lands to be administered by the various uh, umara or military commanders because they held they had such a social uh, structure uh, i think there are many uh things which can be learned about the proper administration and also governance uh i think uh because uh proper governance is what is needed uh, to govern a country uh, and this very much depend on knowledge what you know about the people what you know about the behavior of their behavior and also the knowledge about the bureaucracy and the various you know government uh, bureaucracies you know agencies departments how they function how to maintain a properly running uh, machinery of a government uh, and that is uh, important because these are the instruments of fairness and justice which a ruler or a king or a prince will need in properly governing so as to increase the well-being of the people to take care of them to protect uh, them always and to prevent uh, oppression and injustice so i think that uh, with your question uh, mas when you mm-hmm. say if it is relevant uh, i'm not saying that it, we should go back to you know yeah. uh, uh, implementing all that he said but yeah. certainly there are many Values. advices values uh, and also virtues in this book yeah. that we can learn with regards to how to deal with people because ultimately it's that a country what is a country but it's made up of societies and what are can- uh, societies except that uh, they are in- made up of individuals who are human beings with their psychology with their right. with their motivations and all right perfect inshallah yeah. maybe uh, a conclusion for our discussion this week Listen. So uh so so as I think that is uh, my conclusion but I think many of Nizam Malmuk's findings are as pertinent to government and people today as 900 years ago because uh this is also reiterating what I said before this is why uh in Islam 
history uh, is very important and you know there's also a chapter in the Quran called Surah Al-Qasas you know because the Quran you know sees the history as a record of human actions and human behaviors and mm. these are repetitive uh, so they can be made into a science if you look at history as a science and you have got the data Yeah. And then, if you do the experiments, you are able to repeat uh, this data. Mm -hmm. You run the numbers, and you get a pattern. And mm -hmm. from that pattern, you can predict, you know, the behavior of things. If you do result. this, it will happen. Mm -hmm. Like yes, result. Uh, so from there, uh, we can use we can use the science there in history as uh, something that can uh, provide us with foresight of, of future uh, events and to pro to guide the society and the communities and you know largely the nation we can guide all of this along a desirable path and avoid you know doing uh, things which would ultimately uh, you know, lead the country into ruin into destruction or into corruption so we can this is how we can we, these are the major You know, repeating, uh, repeating or recurring themes in this sort of work, which uh, is classified as a mirror of prince. You know, uh, ensuring uh, justice, putting things in the proper place. You know, right. rewarding your officers, punishing the the mm. way wayward uh, people, and you know, protecting uh, the country. So uh, that is uh, my conclusion, Mas. Right. Thank you very much for your sharing this work on yeah, Nizam al Muksia Setnameh, the book of government in this program, Great Works of the Muslim World. We've been with yeah. Husni Mama Amin and uh, inshallah we'll share again uh, in the next topic with Husni. Yes, inshallah. inshallah. Okay, until yeah. then, thank you very much Husni for your sharing. Assalamualaikum. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.